Good morning. How are you? Good. Not bad. They drew some blood from me, but I think they used an elephant needle. I mean, this thing just swelled all the way. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, doing good. Doing good. God is good. All the time, God's good. Good. Just looking at you. Today we're going to continue in Luke. Luke's gospel will be in chapter 20, verse 9 through 19. And this is a parable that Jesus is speaking. And I really want us today to <clears throat> think in, in, in the bigger picture. It, it, our Christianity quite often is, is around, you know, our own environment, our own tests and trials and victories and various things. It's about, you know, where we live. And that's okay. That's, that's a part of it. God wants to meet our every need. He wants to heal our diseases. He wants to deliver us. Um, so that's good, but um, I think we need to look sometimes at the bigger picture. How do we fit in to, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He began this thing, and he's going to finish this thing. And, and so something more is going on than, you know, just our lives, you know. 66, which is ancient. But I've been looking back over my life lately and, and ministry and, and uh, not in a condemning way, but just looking to see how my life mattered or fit into the overall largeness of God's plan. He created something, and he's going to finish the job. And, you know, where was my life directed? Was it to be a part of that? Um, in my Christianity, was I aware of the fact that <clears throat> I'm a part of something bigger than just the time in which I'm, I'm living? And so... I think this parable speaks to God's bigger plan, and I really do think it's a, a paradigm shift that's going to be happening here in the midst of this parable. I think it's a, a parable that really nails it on the head as to what Jesus is all about as he prepares to go to the cross and how that affects Israel, how that affects the Gentiles, how that affects the purposes and the plans of God. So I'll be kind of approaching it from that. So let's read the parable in <clears throat> verse 19. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let, out, let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent a third. This one also they, would, they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall we do? I will send my beloved son, perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. 
What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy the, those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard this, they said, surely not. And Jesus said, don't call me Shirley. Uh, <laughs> but um, I take it you've seen that movie. <laughs> Everyone who falls, uh, he said, but he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief, has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it'll crush him. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. In the beginning, the first verse, it says, and he began to tell the people its parable. So he was speaking to the people and everyone present, but he had in mind the um, chief priests and the scribes, Pharisees, whoever else was there uh, of Israel's leaders. And Jesus is like that. Parables are like that. They, they can be spoken out, but they could be pinpointing a small group that's in, in the crowd. But he was speaking to the leaders of Israel at that time that were present. And he was uh, um, letting them know uh, the history of Israel and and uh, what's been going on and what's going to go on. Kind of an overall, in the beginning, God desired his creation to be his kingdom, giving humankind aspects of his kingdom to reign over. After Adam and Eve brought on the fall of man and consequent curse, God began the process of redeeming his creation. He began the process of putting things to right again. And he chose Israel out of all the nations to be his representatives on the earth. Now, you know, I'm skipping through a lot of history, Abraham and, and, and all of that, to get to the point where uh, Israel came into existence. But he was moving towards that. And he chose Israel out of all the nations to be his representatives on the earth. They were to reflect his kingdom his glory and image to all the nations. They weren't just to be a nation unto themselves where they, uh, you know, ha-ha, we got the real God and the rest of you, you know, are just heathen. They were to reflect uh, the true God, live their lives in such a way that reflected that, um, love the Lord their God, God was to be their God, and they were to be God's people, and other nations were to see that and say, surely their God is the one true God. And that was their calling. Um, God was desiring to use Israel to restore creation to its original purpose. He was... Uh, um, Establishing his kingdom on earth through the nation of Israel. But Israel failed their calling. Through disobedience and rebellion, they failed even after God's attempt throughout their history. To warn them by sending prophets to them, which he ignored, which they ignored and killed, God demonstrated his mercy, compassion, and patience on Israel down through their history. Now what I'm saying here is in the parable, the owner of the vineyard is God. The owner of the vineyard is God. The, te the tenants are the nation of Israel, the religious leaders of Israel. And the servants sent from the owner of the land are the prophets that God would send to Israel to warn them and and uh, correct them and correct their direction. The son who was sent, of course, was Jesus. So, in Luke twenty nineteen, 
The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So you get what's going on here. Is Jesus told this parable. And the parable is about what Israel has done down through the history. How they failed to fulfill God's purpose for them. But God out of his compassion and his love and his mercy would continue to send his servants, the prophets, to warn them and to redirect them and to you know, get them back on track. But they killed the prophets. And he's telling these scribes and chief priests and Pharisees that are in this audience, you know, this is what the history of your people has been. You have failed to complete what I had created you for. And so uh, the parable uh, in Luke 13, it says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Again, this shows God's compassion and mercy. I mean, really, you think about <clears throat> the owner of a vineyard and the first servant that he sends, you know, they kill or they, you know, maim and beat up and send them away empty. And he does another time and they do the same thing. You'd think that this owner of the vineyard would, would get the idea. <laughs> He's not going to get much from them. But in his compassion, and, and, and mercy, he keeps sending until he sent his son. And then uh, that brought it to a, a point where something needed to be done. So the parable was about Israel's leaders. Uh, the parable was spoken to the people, but it was for the scribes. In another passage in Luke, and I believe that uh, Craig referenced it, last week but it says when he drew near and saw the city he wept over it this is Luke 19 saying would that you even you had known on this day the things that make for peace but now they are hidden from your eyes for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And this spoke of uh, the destruction of Jerusalem that happened in 70 AD. Not one stone was left on top of the other. It was just completely destroyed. Rome had come in and destroyed and the thing with the, the killing the prophets, this is a contemporary thing that Jesus is talking about to, in this parable because they had just recently killed John the Baptist and they're about to kill the Son of God. And now you would think as they listened to this parable and they got it, they perceived it was about them, you'd think that they would repent then and there and say, no. Uh, we don't sound very good. We don't look very good. You know, let's not kill the Son of God and be like our forefathers were. But that didn't stop them. And then in verse 16, it says that, oh, wait, I skipped a passage. Uh, Stephen in Acts 7, he said, You stiff necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears. Wouldn't that be a Encouraging word, we're worshiping God, just loving him. And someone comes forward on the mic, and you stiff-necked people. And, but unfortunately, Israel was like that. Uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did. 
so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the laws delivered by angels and did not keep it. So you see, he's talking about the history of, of Israel and what they did with what God was trying to do in and through them. <clears throat> and it's coming to a point now where, in a sense, that's over with. You kill the son. This thing's done with. You know, I've given you your chance. I've given you an opportunity to repent. I've given you opportunity to change your ways. Uh, but they didn't. So God was going to give the vineyard to others, it says in verse 16. He said, what will I do? And he said, I will take it away from the present people, and I will give it to others. And we'll get back to that. But God transferred the kingdom mission Israel had to Gentile. He transferred it to the Gentiles and Jews who were coming to Christ, who were believing on him. And so now we can say the church inherits Israel's calling. And this is where the shift is, is that he's no longer, no longer is Israel going to uh, be the central representatives of God, but the church is. The church now is going to inherit Israel's calling. They're inheriting the, vine, the vineyard. The calling is to spread the gospel of the kingdom to all the nations, you know, which is what Israel was basically meant to do. Amen. So there's a change here, very important change in the history of God's working with mankind. And... Uh, It's a big change, and a change I think that we as the church, and of course all the church throughout the world, the, the ecclesia, the ones that are called out by God, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, made him Lord. Uh, the church now is to do the work. Um, I want to reference uh, the scripture here. I've got to get back to it. It says in verse 15, uh, back in Luke 20, And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? It says he will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard this, they said, surely not. He, will look, he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. So he's telling them the stone that you're rejecting even now is going to become the cornerstone of God's new building, God's new nation, God's new thing that he's building, that he's going to work through to establish his will and purposes in the earth. In First Peter it says, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion uh, a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, 
Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Ephesians, for through him we both have access to one spirit, to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Christ Jesus himself, the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also built together in a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And I know Pastor Craig read those verses last week, but if we can get a hold on that, that Jesus is rebuilding, and he's building something new, uh, and he's the cornerstone, he's the foundation Everything is built on him. They rejected the stone. They rejected Jesus. But Jesus said, you know, the the stone that you rejected has become the cornerstone of what God is doing now in the earth and who God is using now in the earth. I mean, that's a big deal. That's a big change. That's a big shift, you know. Whatever we understand Israel's thing is, their, their thing is today, there's a lot of theories about Israel's status and Israel's uh, uh, place in, in the end time things and so forth and so on. But point is is that the vineyard had been taken and Jesus is building something brand new and he himself is the cornerstone now the cornerstone if I get this right I don't know if it's true anymore with building but it used to be the stone that was laid first and then off of that they would be able to build their their walls uh, you know, going off of that, uh, build them straight. And uh, it was just the chief foundation. It was the main foundation. And from there, they built on top of that. And uh, <clears throat> that's what Jesus is telling the church now. Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen with precious. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So it's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and following him. We become part of that building that he's building. But it's built on him, not on anything else. And so this doesn't eliminate the Jew, obviously. They can come to Christ and they can be a part of what God is doing new. But the main, the main thing I wanted, to, wanted us to see is how important it is in history what was going on at this moment and what he was saying. I feel like he's saying, you know, guys, it's over with. I'm going to move on to a people that will, you know, follow my ways and will accomplish my purposes. And uh, that's a big change. So he's building his church to become the people of God. He said, uh, he talked to uh, Peter and asked what people were saying about him, who he is. And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said, bless are you, Simon Barjona, the flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. In other words, it was a revelation. It wasn't something that Peter um, could deduce from his own thinking and his own intellect. It was a revelation from God himself. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he goes on to talk about the keys of the kingdom, 
whatever you bind on earth and whatever you loose on earth. God is restoring all of creation and he desires to do it from his dwelling place, the church. And that's kind of a, a weird statement, but he's working through the church and the people of the church to establish his kingdom and to establish his will and purposes. And that happens, of course, through serving him and, and reaching out to our communities and, and different ways that he's doing that. But he is building us up that we might represent him um, in the earth like Israel was supposed to represent. Amen. The church is now called to be the people of God. The point of all this is that Israel was, giving a, was given a calling to be God's people, along with all that that implies. But Israel refused continually to follow God's ways, instead chose to go their own way, even getting to the point of ignoring and killing the prophets God would send to Israel to call them back to himself. This continued up to the time of killing the Son of God. But God raised the Son up from the dead and positioned him as Lord over all things, king over his kingdom. Those that believed and presently believe on him have become the new people of God, called to fulfill what Israel failed to be into, called to hear his word and demonstrate it. Israel was to hear the word of God and then obey it. But I hate to just use the word obey because that sounds like, you know, uh, religion. You know, you're just, if I can obey, obey every little bit of law, you know, I'll be fine with God. But he, he's called us to hear his word and demonstrate it in our lives and demonstrate it to the world. That's part of our calling. He's called us to worship the king in all of his glory. In his temple, we are to worship him and, and adore him and to love him in all of his glory. He called, to be his, he called us to be his temple where he dwells with his people. He had built the, had him build the tabernacle in the wilderness, and that's where he met with the people. And then he had them build a temple, and that's where he met with the people. And now he's called us to be that temple where he has built us together to become uh, the people of God and where he dwells with us. You know, when we come together, we're the temple of God. We are individually, but again, as Craig, I think, hit on this last week, we're the temple of God. Isn't that awesome? He's here. He dwells in our midst. That's awesome. And we can worship him, we can talk to him, we can just hang out with him, we can just know that he's dwelling with us, he can talk to us, and we're just his temple, uh, and we're his people. We're called to proclaim his glorious gospel to all nations. Now the church as a whole, every, every, every local church does their part in that are called to various ways in which they can fulfill that. Um, but nonetheless, we're called to proclaim his glorious gospel to all nations. And we're also called to be those whose intercessions and prayers join heaven and earth together. 
I'm going to use the same two examples that you used last week. So I'll wake you up when it's done. And <laughs> but the type of intercession that uh, I'm going to read about is the type that's focused on the calling of God to come and finish what he started in the beginning. You ever let that be your, your, your call of your heart in prayer? God, finish what you started. In the beginning, God, and then he had, he, he wants to finish this. And he's working to finish this. I don't know exactly what his his method or you know how he, what he's doing all over the earth, but he is working to finish what he started, which is the new heaven and the new earth. And so this this type of intercession focuses on on asking God come and finish what you started and it's asking his kingdom to come in its fullness and its finality I like how they end Revelation 22 it says surely I'm coming amen come Lord Jesus you know even if we begin to end our prayer time in our own personal life or whatever with that thought, you know, all the things that we covered in prayer and the things God lays on our heart and we intercede for, and then we, we end it all by saying, amen, come Lord Jesus. I believe that in Luke 2, 36, it talks about Anna the prophetess, says was the daughter of, of Anna, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived her hus lived with her husband seven years when she was a virgin, and then a widow until she was 84. And if I got that figured out right, it's about 77 years. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting. I don't think I have that figured out right, but it's about 70 years. Worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. Coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Israel. Now this is a, a, a woman who decided to give herself to the Lord in prayers and fastings and service in the temple. I'm sure she didn't constantly every moment that she was praying she served in different ways and and worshipped in the temple. But it says that she did not depart from the temple, worshipping with fasting, prayer, and prayer night and day. At the coming of the very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Israel. I really believe, and this is uh, speculative on my part, but I believe that she was praying, probably used the Psalms, used the, the prayer book of the Old Testament, and but her heart was praying for the Messiah to come, for God to fulfill his plan that she understood from, from what we would call the Old Testament, what, whatever she had available to her, but understanding that a Messiah was coming and that's the bigger picture. I'm sure she had, you know, personal needs that she probably prayed over and, and, and such, but she prayed the bigger picture for all those years, praying and fasting and looking for you know, the coming of the Messiah. And I just feel like that's a type of intercession that, has caught on a little bit throughout uh, different movements in the country. Um, there's 24 
seven prayer going on in different areas. And, uh, you know, that's, that's all they do when they get together is worship and pray. And I think it would be difficult, obviously, for a church to, you know, try to copy that type of uh, ministry. But we can individually in our life and at times corporately, pray, but pray the big picture. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Even so come, Lord Jesus. And look at the, the Psalms. I think uh, there's a number of them. I don't, didn't list them. And look at uh, other scriptures, and you can... Uh, Use that as a prayer base for praying for the Lord or for God to finish his work. So let me move on. Now there was a man in Luke chapter 2, verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. And it goes on as far as uh, describing um, that his eyes have seen salvation, prepared a presence for all the people, and so forth. But it says there was a man who was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And that word consolation just really means comfort, but the meaning is there, he was waiting for the Messiah to come, for God to come and do what God said he was going to do in the earth. And so those are some intercessions that I think we could be a part of uh, in our life. Uh, it can be a part of our prayer time. It doesn't have to consume it. And we don't have to, you know, feel like we need to beg or or anything like that. But I think it's important that we include that. Um, I really believe that the prayers of that, uh, <clears throat> I forgot her name, lady in the, in the temple, uh, I really believe that her prayers helped bring Jesus to earth, helped the process. As God responds to our prayers, God reveals his will to us and then asks us to pray it back to him. He reveals his will to us and then asks us to pray it back to him. You know, he, that's what prayer is quite often. He reveals something to you in prayer uh, and then you take that and you pray it back to him. If he reveals something and says, I want to do this, I want this accomplished, I want this accomplished, so and so, then you pray that back to him and say, Lord, do this, do that, according to your will, according to what you've said. So anyway, I just felt like that was important, that we as the church have have uh, replaced, if you will, I hate to use that term, but have replaced the ministry that Israel had and we are to be about all the things that I listed. And intercession is, is one of them that I think is very important. Amen? Amen. The calling on his church is to be the people of God and model his kingdom to the nations. The calling of his church is to be the people of God and model his kingdom 
to all the nations. Um, sometimes when we think of evangelism, we think of just one-on-one -on -one and, you know, confrontational and, and, you know, speaking to somebody while you're holding their arms so they can't get away from you and that type of thing. But our witness, that's part of it is speaking to someone one-on-one -on -one as God leads you and, and so forth. But the, our witness is really to model the kingdom of God. When a person sees the church, whether it's you individually or a church collective, they should be able to see what the kingdom of God is like. They should be able to see what God is like and, and say, I want to be a part of that. Amen. And that's what Israel was to be in amongst all the nations that they were amongst, is that they were to model what it is to have God, the one true God, as their God, as they lived according to God's ways. And other nations noticed that. Um, that was what they were to be about. The church models the kingdom of God by following Jesus together. Modeling what God's love is, what his compassion, his grace, his power, his holiness, what it looks like in community. When the world looks at the church, the people, they should be able to see the kingdom of God on earth to see what God is like. Eventually, God is going to restore this creation. It's going to look like what he originally wanted it to look like when he created. It's not necessarily going back to the Garden of Eden. It's going beyond the Garden of Eden. How he had originally created it. Uh, and just no hatred, no ugliness, no violence, no uh, none of that. Not even thorns, thistles. Wouldn't that be nice? You wouldn't have to weed your garden. All of that. But he's going to restore creation back to its original and beyond. And that's what he's doing overall. And right now he's using the church to call in as many of the nations as he can possibly do before uh, he ends this thing, or ends this part of it and brings in the new. Amen. And we're all a part of that. In our, our lives, individually, we have our struggles, we have our, our temptations, we have our, our life that we need to pray over and love each other over and minister to each other. All of that is absolutely necessary to keep the body of Christ healthy and whole so that we can do what we've been called to do. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, you're so much bigger than anything we could imagine. It's easy, Lord, to get caught up in in our everydayness. And it's right and proper to cry out to you to have that abundant life that you've called uh, that, uh, to give us, that you've promised to give us. But it's also right, Lord, to cry out to you to finish what you've started. Lord, each of us will live. Generations have come and gone. Believers have come and gone. And the work continues. And we ask, Lord God, that you would just move in your people that we would become what you've called us to become in all the different ways and all the different things. 
that you would move by your Holy Spirit and that you'd place in our heart that hunger to have you come. Not to escape the world and escape the earth or escape our life, but to see you, Lord, finish and see the glorious results of what you are about. We cry out to you, Lord. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.